I'm slightly overwhelmed uh, by the presentation. And any question that uh, I could produce probably sounds or seems very banal. So I want to turn to you for help at this moment. We're also running out of time. Is there somebody who wants to grab the mic and immediately they ask a question? Josef does. I, I want to join actually Harta, please. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that I thought you were already sitting. Please come in, come, 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 come in. Josef Buxton has a question. Please use the microphone. Just a very simple question to Katya Djokovic because I know that subject she discussed uh, quite well and I totally agree with what been said by her. But uh, the question, my question is, what do you mean uh, speaking about post-colonial in case of our wonderful country of Russia? Mm. Um, well, uh, one can interpret the anti-Europeanism, uh, so to speak, uh, in official, which sometimes is present in the official doctrine of uh, Russia, uh, as a post-colonial, uh, post paradoxical post-colonial liberation from European colonialism of 18th century, of uh, Peter the Great. S <laughs> yes, of course, we were colonized uh, by Europe. So ca yeah, I, coming out of China, I immediately uh, saw the same thing, but they were colonized later. So, and Russia was colonized in the 18th century where there was no discourse of colonization. Uh, I'm actually very happy with the fact we were colonized, but if we apply these logics, and, that's, and the, the problem is that's what they do, they can apply these progressive logics for a non-progressive goal. And these people who are suddenly becoming orthodox, uh, if, if they were, even when they were communist all their life, and now they are 70, and they are suddenly becoming orthodox fan fanaticists. So this is a kind of post-colonial logics, unfortunately. Because uh, as far as I know, we're we more often using the term self Yes, yes, yes. Self colonization. Yeah. yeah, we can, we can. So I just didn't go into we, details. Yeah. Unlike other countries and nations, we colonize ourselves. Our, ourselves. Yeah, there were a couple of foreigners also. You but know, maybe, we speak, we, maybe we should speak about the post self colonization. Uh, maybe, I have to think about it. Thank you. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, re a relatively overwhelming how a former East. Um, outside Russia, <laughs> adopted the discourses of post-colonialism instantly from the 1990s yes, onwards, yes, yes. And, we did. and applied just one on one after having been colonized by Soviet, uh, Soviet Russia. So it's quite interesting development going on there, but that's just a side remark. Uh, Irit had a question, maybe uh, we can give a microphone to Irit Rogov. So first, thank you all very much for these very interesting presentations. My question is to Anka and Maria. Um, and I, I was very interested in the um, sort of minor scale of gesture that you were sort of, of, of plotting out. And I wanted to ask you if you, if you think about resonance, how you think about resonance, because that was the question that emerged for me from the presentation. And about the relation of resonance, you know, within a kind of public, public space to surveillance, because it seemed to me that one of the operative captures of what you were talking about was the possibility of a capture by surveillance. But there's another sort of possibility of kind of, of creating a resonance within public space that um, you were somehow less um, specific about. And so I, I, I wanted to draw you out on that. Yeah, actually, how when we structured our presentation, we wanted to revisit places where uh, former spaces that we used were. So exactly because we had in mind this, what, what are the traces that stay behind the gestures that we do, you know, like, I don't know, our first space is now covered in commercial meshes. Uh, this, uh, another space in Timisoara is just an empty space where some of the traces stay in, in public sphere, just some text we glue to the wall. So these are the physical traces that stayed. But on the other hand, what we are hoping are that 
other gestures emerge out of this, out of, out of, out of this te really temporary projects. And f from our knowledge, this sometimes happened. Like there are, I don't know, uh, people and colleagues of ours who uh, state that, I don't know, they met in contexts that some of our projects created, or we met other people in, in similar contexts. So I think this traces uh, remain at the level of, of everyday interactions between people who are not just in the art field, but in, in broader fields, like, uh, I don't know, starting from like circles of art students, and then another circle is uh, people who are in other domains, but still in some sort of intellectual, I don't know, let's say, uh, environment, but also maybe just people who were on the street when some of the projects happened and when they entered the space uh, by some sort of coincidence. And, and we, are, we are thinking in this sort of, real, of, uh, of relations that are created out of these projects, which you cannot really pinpoint to or you cannot just, uh, uh, I know, show in a, in a photo or express in a presentation as your merit or your project, but that happens anyway. Like, it's like uh, Mr. Rajit said, Good. like this inv invisible, uh, in invisible traces, invisible things that you cannot, you cannot uh, tell about them exactly what they are. But uh, on the other hand, also these resonances or these traces are also inside ourselves because we, uh, when we met these situations, uh, when we created them, then. Also, we met other things that we were not uh, planning them to happen, or uh, our our meetings with situations and people also changed ourselves. So, Irid, would you mind making uh, using the microphone? So, what I'm thinking about is the way in which a series of sort of micro intensities accrue into an event, right? And that, that event doesn't necessarily have to be a recognizable one within certain kinds of traditional narratives. And I was listening to Ravi Sundaram talk about urban modernity and, and new technologies, and he was talking about you know two people having an argument, a third one filming it through a, a, a sort of phone camera, emailing it. Um, that, an, an event gets created in that multiple audiences kind of, of built up. And, and in a way, that's what I'm trying to think about in terms of resonance. And, um, and, and it's, it's extremely difficult to kind of, of, of articulate. Uh, and in a, way, in a way, you don't want to pin it down. You, know, you, don't, you don't want to say, okay, this is how you know, the event was created. But at the same time, it seems really necessary to somehow do so. So I, I suppose, you know, there was all this sort of subtle flitting around the, the sort of city and, and I, was, I wanted to see how you thought it accrued. Initially for Harta, um, the uh, methodologies that you seemed you seem to have developed out of necessity um, have been formulated now it would appear into a perfectly viable horizon for contemporary art um, so well not least by yourselves um, so firstly uh, what do you see as the difference between the work you do and um, the ways in which social practice has been instrumentalized through particularly the education programs of um, contemporary arts most visible institutions and secondly um, you talked about how what you do sometimes exceeds the category of art um, and uh, taking a cue from Ekaterina Dego's uh, concluding uh, remarks I I wonder where precisely the value of the context of art occurs for you. Do you think it's in the actual um, process by which you work, 
when you're working or do you think it's in the space for reflection upon what you do like right now? To your first question, like if our practice uh, can be instrumentalized or not, this is, if I understand well, this is your first question, like if what we do as educational practice can, it's uh, in the danger of uh, becoming too institutionalized or what is the difference between an institutionalized practice and our practice? Um, I know, I think we all are in this danger all the time and it's something that it's, it's, quite, it's quite important to have in mind. But on the other hand, uh, how we t try to, to do it is that you are never, we, at the people, we are never in the position of the ones who know or of, of the ones who are um, having any, who are having the answers or who are having the, uh, all the possibilities to put the questions but more we are thinking about how you can create uh, situations where different kind of knowledges can come together and can, uh, and in this way, you know, to produce something that is not controllable, not by us and not by the others, but that can occur and can then become interesting. So in a way, the, the agenda, you know, is, is is this that you, we, we try to be as non-hierarchical as possible, even if it's not always possible, you know, like relations of power are always there, but in a way, maybe in this constant awareness is how we try to, to avoid this danger of incorporation. And to your second question, uh, how we use what we do as artists, I don't know, how we know how to do things because we we are artists as background and as our in, as interests and so on. So it's more like we use what we know from the field of art as a possibilities to construct something. Or maybe this is the simplest answer. I don't know. I had, would also have a comment to this because I thought there's one thing which is so obviously appropriated and turned into something else. It is actually the cover of one of your book where it is said share and care, which could also be kind of an advertisement for, for uh, bonds or advertisement uh, for human rights, uh, advertisement for curative NGO organization. And I think it's very interesting how you appropriate and make it to a real value again, something that we have to do in our own lives. But it is a slogan. You know, I, I really, when I saw this, it's very interesting, I mean, how even a slogan can be turned appropriated and direct to something else, to a practice in the everyday. Yeah, yeah I think, should I? Yeah, we are really interested in that because somehow it's, it's part of our history that uh, words were really turned into slogans, you know, before 89, and really important and valuable words such as, I don't know, for example, solidarity, is one word that is, it was, it's really difficult to use in our context, but on the other hand, it's really important to, to actualize. I know, and yeah, so. I would like to bring something um, in, and that's departs from what you mentioned, uh, Katja, about um, the comparison between the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 21st century. It, it, uh, it's, it's truly surfacing from a number of conversations and it's quite fascinating. However, you kind of somehow, jo somehow joined, uh, jo jokingly pointed out that it would mean communism is yet ahead of us. And I wonder whether it's a good news or a bad news. And I want to, I want to bring something, if Simon allows me, from our conversation this morning. We somehow... Um, there's something in the air that I, that I want to call a communism chic. We so proudly, after 20 years of getting rid, rid of an oppressive system, proudly go on stage and say, I'm communist, I'm communist too, and it's extraordinarily fancy and fashionable. 
Now, I want to distance myself personally, having lived through communist system radically from this constellation. And I'm aware, and I read all the books about communist hypothesis, and I'm aware that words can be filled with other meanings today. But I'd like to suggest we go about this thing in a rather nuanced way, because communism as a system has been a radically oppressive system. So I wonder how, how you, you have seen it and whether the communist hypothesis of Badiou is really something we should keep in uh, circulating in these conversations where he says, my hypothesis of communism has nothing to do with the political experiment of the 20th century, but it's something that I would dub as radical justice and equality. That part I agree with, but I wonder whether this is the right name we need to bring into our conversations, and it was uh, also surfacing in, in your conversation and your conversation, so I thought it, it would be, this would be an interesting moment perhaps to point the, the dangers uh, in as well, because uh, the critique of neoliberal capitalism does not necessarily m mean invitation of communism, you know, or, or is it that simple? Because sometimes we, we tend to kind of, you know, see this kind of dialectic um, uh, a bit, um, or oh, inviting too easily, too quickly, too fast. Uh, yes, of course it was half joke and of course we have to be historically precise and uh, maybe we had to start for my West project uh, with the workshop on the terminology. <laughs> yes, actually what is uh, communism, what is socialism, uh, what what means, uh, because of course communism has a distant horizon as it was the case for Marx and we might uh, in make us believe that it is the case, forgetting the whole history of what already took place and starting anew. This is one thing. What was uh, built in Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc, it's a question. Some people think it was not communism at all, it was a way of state capitalism. Uh, and for some of the countries of uh, at least uh, former Yugoslavia, this was definitely the case. So it was there, and I think what uh, I feel is not enough present is, is in the left-wing debate in the West, so to speak. It's critic of Stalinism, definitely. So we do not differentiate enough between Leninism, Stalinism, post-Stalinism. These were all very different times with very different positions and very different oppressions and liberties. And uh, it's true that sometimes I feel with my uh, Western, Western friends that they have, uh, they still have some belief, uh, I'm not even talking about Soviet Union in Cuba or even North Korea. And I feel this is deeply rooted, this, there is a necessity of such a belief in them. And I can only be very sad listening to them, but I think it's not addressed enough. Um, this is one of the tasks uh, of the future, I think. Um, uh, my name is Andreas. I wanted to thank you all for your very interesting talks. Um, I find it very interesting that we are trapped here uh, between um, concepts, like between uh, communism and neoliberalism and this in a conference where it's about finding something new and I think it, this would be the opportunity to open it up uh, towards um, just imagining new uh, definitions maybe and in this context I wanted to ask you especially as women and it might sound a bit harsh but we are all experiencing this backdrift in, in images and uh, practices. And do you think that especially the, the feminine can be now an interesting um, field for these new practices as you are somehow constantly forced to redefine yourself in your sexually, uh, sexual and social identity. You first. <laughs> 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 
or doesn't it have any importance at all? I think it, it is, of course, it is important, uh, but if you are a woman or a man, it makes a difference. But also I think it's, it's, the question is more complicated than just sexual or gender related, or you know, it depends also on, on so many other uh, things, you know. Also, so many assemblages, like, I think it's, it's such a difference if you are a white woman or a Roma woman, you know, or, so I don't know exactly if only feminine can be a definitive No, no thing. not definitely, mm -hmm. but I was addressing uh, the question to you, so. Mm -hmm. I thought, now specifically in your case. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, of course it, it is, a, it can be a starting point the way, because being a woman of course is a category which is, I don't know, um, can be marginal, although numerically of course women are same or more than men, but on the other hand, I, I say this, the same thing, but I think it's, it's more important to, to think about it in, in more assemblage terms. When just I, for me, it's a bit problematic to speak from my position only as 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 a representative of wom women, you know. <laughs> and also, maybe it's important to see what we all have in common, like what 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 problems we we can all point to uh, from our perspectives, so that we can we, we should not just try to present one. <laughs> And I wonder whether from your question, I'm not taking your time, I just, I just wonder whether from your question, because you said we're trapped between discussion between communism and capitalism, whether from your question, instead of being trapped in this gender discourse between a woman and a man, could you make a proposition out of it? You know, just taking your advice to try to construct a new discourse. Whether you have a proposition out of this question? N definitely not yet, no. Okay. <laughs> I do. But Katya does. Uh, you see, we Eastern European women, we do not like to define oneself <laughs> as women. But I'm not, also not an essentialist. I'm uh, more in the discourse of using this uh, identity. And I, I would say it's the same thing as with art. Art is now, we can use the identity of art to make things easier for someone, I don't know, to declare him or her artist and to save him or her from jail. In the same way of uh, things, these girls declared themselves girls and it made their performance more socially effective for very concrete but very different and very social reasons. But they could have been men, by the way. Yeah, we do, we do not know. So they could disguise themselves as girls, but they could have been guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a question of using. So in some situations, it's, it's more uh, effective to be a woman, I can tell you. <laughs> but not <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I can only, uh, only say that this, is, this ties beautifully to Ashok's uh, comments in the morning, speaking about network how you use the network strategically in order to escape its limitations. And I think on this note, we can have a cup of coffee. Yes. <laughs> I thank you for a wonderful session. Thank you. Don't forget your badges. You know why they, uh, they are important for coffee breaks. 15 minutes, four o'clock. I'll look forward to seeing you. <laughs>